Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In today's video, we're going to talk about how you can leave your financial advisor, your investment advisor. Uh, we're going to sort of look at the nuts and bolts of how to do it. And uh, it's come up because I've gotten, well, honestly, I've gotten dozens of emails over the, the years from folks unhappy with uh, the, the, the person they've hired to manage their investments. Recently, I received two emails. Let me share them with you. The first came from Paul. I'll just read a portion of it because it's just stunning what he's had uh, had to, to deal with. And uh, here's what he says. He says, I hate to bother you. I'm trying to fix a giant mess. Three accounts with, are you ready for this? 24 funds. That's what two advisors put him in. And he's trying to figure out you know, how to unravel that mess. And then I received another email uh, recently, and this one uh, comes from Dan. He said, uh, after spending decades reading about stock investing and more recently watching over 100 hours of YouTube videos on investing, I finally found guys like you, Bogle, and J.L. Collins, who cut through the confusion and make sense to me. I'm a huge fan of your videos and logic, sometimes to the annoyance of my wife. I tend to have that effect on women. Okay. Uh, he says, I have a financial advisor at Edward Jones who has most of my retirement investments. I rolled over the four, my 401ks to IRAs, uh, has about a half a million dollars. Uh, she has me in a bunch of managed mutual funds. I would like to move everything to low cost ETFs like VTI. And then he asked, does it make sense to move everything or does the cost of conversion typically outweigh the benefits? Well, those are great questions and we're going to walk through it. And there really are a couple of different reasons why you might want to leave your investment advisor. Probably the, the chief reason would just be fees. You've just gotten tired of paying uh, fees both to your investment advisor, usually a percentage of assets under management. Uh, the industry will say 1% is sort of reasonable, but as, as we know, over uh, decades of investing, it'll cost you a small fortune. Uh, but then it can also be, as we saw with Paul, an, an absurdly complex portfolio that itself can have fees because they may have you, as in Dan's case, in these managed funds that can cost 1% or more for the funds. So all in, you can easily be spending more than 2% um, you know, a year between paying your advisor and paying the fees for the mutual funds. And if you think about retirement where you can take out maybe 4 to 5%, well, if you've got 2% going to, to, to investment fees, uh, that leaves you very little to spend you know, on yourself. So. Step one would be, uh, if we're going to go through this process, the steps I would take. Uh, the first thing would be to look at your contract with your advisor. There's probably a provision in there about how you terminate it. It may be just be in writing, signed by you, nothing fancy. Um, in theory, there could be fees, so you want to look for that. I, I think in most cases, I would be surprised to see that. But you want to make sure that you understand the steps you need to take. Again, it's probably going to simply be uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a termination in, in writing uh, to your advisor. I do think it makes sense to call your advisor and let them know what you're doing. I think if they have integrity and character, uh, they may try to talk you out of it a little bit, but they're not going to give you a hard sell. They're certainly not going to try to intimidate you or, or use scare tacit, tactics, which I have heard about. Advisors saying things like, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. If that happens, it just underscores, in my view, why you need to leave that advisor uh, but hopefully you're dealing with someone with integrity. And frankly, if you are, they'll actually help you a bit in the process. But I think that's step one. Understand your contract. Talk to your, to your advisor. Now, before you leap, and I would do the next few steps before you actually reach out to your advisor. The first thing would be, where do you want to have your account? Where do you want your investments to go? And there are a couple of options I would suggest here. And I'll leave links to everything I mentioned below the video. The first option is actually to leave them where they are, not with your advisor, but your advisor is going to have them, uh, they're going to be custodied somewhere uh, at a broker. And you may be perfectly happy with that broker. You can keep them there and not use your advisor. Uh, they may or may not have to be transferred to a different account, uh, but you could find that out. So if they're, for example, if they're at Fidelity, you could call Fidelity and find out. But you could just leave them where they are if you're happy with that. If you're looking for just a sort of a full service broker, there are a lot of good options. If I had to pick one out of all of them, it would be Fidelity. I just like their technology. I like their customer service. They have great investments. And of course, you know, you can invest in just about anything wherever you go. You don't have to invest in Fidelity funds, even if you have an account at Fidelity. Again, a lot of other good options, but I like Fidelity. 
If you're wanting sort of an automated investing service, sometimes referred to as a robo-advisor, my, I think my first choice would be Betterment. I think it just offers the, the, the richest array of, 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 of features. Uh, the app is very easy to use and the fees are reasonable. Uh, and then the other one I like uh, is M1 Finance if you're wanting sort of uh, some automated tools because you can rebalance with the click of a button but don't want to pay uh, the fees. I think M1 Finance is an option. It doesn't have all of the features though that Betterment does. So if you're nearing retirement, you really want to sort of think through like what cash management features you have, although M1 Finance has that too, um, but what kind of features you want to go with your, your account. Uh, and you, want, you want to consider that before you make a decision. And of course, there are plenty of other reasonable options beyond what I've mentioned. But again, you want to know where you want to open the account. And the other thing you want to figure out, you know, again, before I think bef before you talk to your advisors, how you're going to invest your money. Now, as you guys know, I'm a big fan, at least as, an, an, as a starting point in the three fund portfolio. So that's just you know a, a fund to cover U.S. stocks, one to cover international stocks, and one to cover bonds. I've done a video on that. I'll link to it below this video. There are many ways to actually implement that. You could use a target date retirement fund, since we are talking about a retirement account in Dan's case. Uh, there's something called a multi-asset fund. Uh, this would be something along the lines of Vanguard's life strategy funds. Fidelity has at least one. In fact, I can show that to you. Here it is. This is just a Fidelity multi-asset fund. It's, it's an expense of 11 basis points. You do have to sort of accept its asset allocation. I believe this one happens to be about, yeah, about 85% equities and roughly uh, 10 to 15%, I guess, uh, yeah, in fixed income. Again, my point here is that there are a lot of different ways to actually invest in uh, a very simple portfolio that covers U.S. stocks, international stocks, and bonds. You just need to figure out the strategy that's best for you. In the past, I've also mentioned four, five, and six fund portfolios. They, they just take the three fund portfolio and add additional exposure to some other asset classes like emerging markets, real estate, or perhaps U.S. small cap uh, investments. Those are certainly options, and I talk about them in the three fund uh, video I'll link uh, to below this one. The real key, keep it simple and keep it low cost, keep it well diversified. And there are, there are countless ways to actually do that. But the point is, you need to pick the one that you're most comfortable with. You kind of want to know where you're going to leap before you actually make the jump. So that's the idea there. Now, the final thing before we actually start talking about how to transfer this account is, you do want to make sure uh, uh, and understand if there are any costs to sell the funds that you're currently in. Normally there's not, but there are some funds that have what are called back-end loads, where you actually, you don't pay a, a fee to buy the fund, but you do pay a fee if you sell it. Now, those kinds of fees tend to go away after, say, five to 10 years, depends on the terms uh, of the funds. You may not even have that kind of fund in your portfolio, but it's something that you want to make sure and understand. If you do sell any of your funds, you know, is there a cost to do it, all right? And then, so once you understand, you, you, you know where you want to go with your, your investments, you know what you want to invest in, you understand the cost, you've talked to your advisor. Uh, the actual process of moving the investments, while it can be scary, and I've done this many times, and yeah, it kind of is scary if you're moving a large amount of money. It's really not that difficult. And the very first thing I do is I call the firm where I'm going to transfer the money to. So if I'm going to open up a Fidelity account or a Betterment account, uh, I talk to them because as you can imagine, they're excited to get your money. They're excited to get you as a client and they have entire departments that can help you transfer uh, your, your investments uh, from one firm uh, to another. In fact, let me kind of just show you what this looks like. This just happens to be from Betterment, um, but the process is the same. And what they, the, the sort of the easiest way is this ACATS, which stands for Automated Customer Account Transfer Service. Uh, which is just a uh, sort of an industry standard way to move investment accounts. And so, uh, again, this process would be the same whether you're Betterment, you, you, you move to Betterment or Fidelity or Vanguard, but uh, they notify your current provider. Current provider, uh, you know, uh, reviews the request, understands, you know, the accounts and, and sends over the money. And then in this case, with Betterment, since it's an automated investing service, they take your money and deploy it in various ETFs uh, based on the um, strategy you pick. Here's Betterment's core 
uh, portfolio. And you can see there's actually 10 funds here, which, you know, if I were investing on my own, uh, that would be more than I would want. But of course, Betterment takes care of all of this. So, you know, it, 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 it's not, um, it, it's not a headache. If you were going to invest at Fidelity on your own or Vanguard, personally, I would not have 10 funds. I would try to keep it uh, uh, more simple than that. Uh, but, but that's basically the process. It, it, it's not really complicated. It can happen fairly quickly. You're not out of the market very long, usually just a matter of a few days. And um, that process, again, is pretty much standard in the industry. Now, because we're talking about a retirement account, I am going to mention taxable accounts in a minute. We don't have to worry about taxes. So we don't have to, you know, we could sell all of our investments to cash in a retirement account, uh, move it over to save Fidelity or Betterment or wherever, and then deploy it as we want to. Um, we don't have to worry about transferring the investments, what's called transferring them in kind in a retirement account, but we will talk about that in a minute. So again, you transfer the, the, the money and you deploy it, whether it's a three fund portfolio, whether you let Betterment do it, whatever you've decided, and you're done. I, I wish I could try to make this a little more nuanced and subtle and complicated, but it's just not. It's really that simple. Now, where things can get a little more interesting is in a taxable account. And uh, here uh, we have to worry about selling investments that might trigger capital gains. So we have a couple of things to think about. The first is we can do, as I alluded to a minute ago, in-kind transfer. So rather than selling the investment to cash and then moving it to say Fidelity or wherever, we actually move the investment itself. So we just simply say, okay, we own VTI in, in Schwab and we're now going to simply move those shares over to Fidelity. It doesn't trigger a sale and therefore it doesn't trigger capital gains. And again, uh, wherever you're going to, to um, move your account, they can help you do that. Now, by and large, with stocks and ETFs, you can move them over in kind. There may be some exceptions. If there are, they can tell you, but I've never had any issues in the past, and I've done this before, moving stocks and ETFs in kind. I've also had success moving mutual funds in kind. They can be a little trickier. There could be some mutual funds that, depending on where you're going to move your assets to, uh, you couldn't move them in kind. And so if you've got a taxable account with mutual funds in it, uh, and really for any assets, you want to confirm that you can move them in kind. And again, if you're going to move them wherever, Schwab, Vanguard, Fidelity, they'll be able to help you with that. Now. Uh, that could get rid of the investment advisor fee, right? Because you're now on your own, you move them in kind. Uh, but you still may, like in Paul's case, have a mess of a portfolio with 24 different investments that you'd really like to simplify. The problem might be that you sort of have golden handcuffs because selling these investments uh, could trigger capital gains. So unfortunately, if you're in that scenario, there aren't always easy answers. You can maybe liquidate certain investments over time rather than all at once, depending on your capital gains tax rate um, and save a little bit of money. Um, I hesitate because the capital gains rate, uh, you may be able to, it, it may not save you money to do it over time. You just have to look at your specific tax situation uh, to understand that. You could look at specific lots. Uh, uh, you know, where maybe you have some purchases of an investment that are at a loss or not much of a gain and others that are a significant, significant gains, you could hold off on selling the gains to, uh, and sell the ones that are at losses or, 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 you know, or not at significant gains, or, you know, maybe you've got some lots you can sell at a loss and that could offset some gains. Yeah, this can get uh, kind of complicated. And so it may be helpful to actually seek out some tax advice before uh, you, you make uh, any moves, but you could look at selling specific lots to reduce your tax liability. The other thing I'll mention is uh, you should, generally I turn off automated dividend reinvestment in my taxable accounts. I let it go to cash first, and then I decide where to deploy it. That would certainly be true if you have some investments that you really aren't you know, you don't want to increase uh, what you have there. You're actually trying to get out of them. I would certainly turn off any automatic in, uh, dividend reinvestments because you don't you don't want to add to those investments. Unfortunately, this process could actually make your portfolio even more complicated as you sell parts of these bad investments to buy investments like VTI and other index funds 
And so you end up with actually more funds as you sort of slowly transfer away from uh, the bad investments that an advisor has put you into. Again, you've just got to na- analyze the tax consequences and figure out what's best for you. There aren't always easy answers. And with that in mind, one last I- uh, thought that I want to leave you with in today's video. Whenever you're investing in a taxable account, you want to project forward 10, 20, 30 years and think, what's it going to look like when the investments I'm in uh, have significant gains? If I'm happy keeping them, that's great. But could I find myself in a position where I have a very complicated portfolio that I'm not happy with? For example, direct in- and indexing is sort of the new feature that everyone's talking about, where rather than investing in an index like the S&P 500 through one fund, you actually uh, put your money in individual stocks, usually not 500, but it might be 100 or 200. And that way you can take, take advantage of some tax loss harvesting. That sounds good. But now let's fast forward 20 years when your portfolio has two or even 300 positions. Well, if you're paying someone to manage this direct indexing, okay, I guess. But if you ever wanted to get rid of those fees and then handle it on your own, boy, it makes Paul's 24 fund portfolio look like a walk in the park. So you really wanna be thoughtful about how you invest your money in a taxable account because as capital gains build up, you could find yourself in a position where you've got a really complicated portfolio and no easy way to simplify it. Well, there you go. That's my sort of approach to getting out uh, from under uh, you know, a bad investment advisor, which to me includes any that charge a lot of fees. Um, in a retirement account, pretty straightforward. In a taxable account, you know, you got to deal with the capital gains issue. And depending on your circumstances, there may be no easy answer to that. Well, listen, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Be happy to help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.